Uh, good evening. The uh, Roman Aqaba project aims to reconstruct diachronically the economy of this international port from its foundation in the late first century BC up to the early Islamic. Although it is impossible for me to acknowledge individually the contributions of all these colleagues, I'm obviously indebted to all for the evidence in this paper. Methodology and study of the regional environment, a regional survey, and extensive excavation. Results of the first two components appeared in 2014, the first volume of our final report series. Results from excavation is nearing its final form and offer many insights into Isla's economic history. Excavations revealed domestic areas, two cemeteries, a city wall, and a possible early church. Analysis of the artifacts and organic remains opens new windows into Isla's economy. The project has completed analysis of most categories of such evidence. However, analysis of a few categories is available only in preliminary form. Nevertheless, sufficient evidence is currently available for a relatively detailed diachronic reconstruction of Isla's economy. This paper will summarize this, this reconstruction from Isla's foundation in the late first century BC to the Islamic conquest of the early seventh century. For each period, the paper will consider local economic production and commercial exchange, noting in particular significant changes versus continuity in economic terms. Isla lies at the northern end of the Gulf of Aqaba within the great rift that extends southward to the Red Sea. Uh, today, the region is hyper-arid with minimal rainfall. However, a fresh water is available through tapping groundwater just below the surface, making Aqaba a coastal oasis. Coastal plain is flanked by mountains to the east and west, but lies open via Wadi Araba to the north. So we'll talk about Isla first in, in, in the Nabataean period, from about 30 BC to 8106. Isla was founded by the Nabataeans circa 30 BC. I have suggested that its foundation was a Nabataean response to the threat of their to their commerce by the Roman conquest of Egypt and, and their revitalization of the Egyptian Red Sea ports. You see two here circled in red. To, to wrest the lucrative commerce and aromatics from the Nabataeans and their overland routes through the Arabian Peninsula. The economy of Isla must be seen through the lens of the project's regional survey. The Nabataean period was by far the best represented period in the southeast Wadi Araba. These sites appeared in the late first century BC, contemporary with the foundation of Isla itself. Thus, it is tempting to explain these sites with the rise of Isla, which would have served as a convenient market for agricultural and animal products derived from such sites in the city's hinterland. The recovery of sherds of Aqaba ware imported amphorae and a few, uh, and some fine wear at some survey sites might in turn represent products acquired at Isla in exchange. Other sites serve to protect and serve as caravan traffic connecting Isla, Petra, and Gaza. As for Isla itself, uh, a, a key point is its sheer aerial size in this period, suggesting that the Nabataean settlement extended over an area of at least 17 and a half hectares. Nabataean Isla was clearly much larger than a mere caravan station, supported by its description as a, quote, polis, unquote, by both Strabo and Josephus in the first century AD. Nabataean Isla's, uh, Isla's economy is more, uh, is more enigmatic than later period. Stratified remains are confined to the last half of the first century AD, although insights may be gleaned from residual mines. Several domestic complexes uh, founded de novo on the northwest fringe of the city suggest significant urban expansion in the late first century. In short, Nabataean Isla was growing in size right up to the Roman conquest in 106. Virtually all structures from this period are modest in size and materials. They are largely mud brick, sometimes on stone foundations. There is no evidence of monumental structures, any discernible urban plan, nor urban fortifications. Strabo, in fact, claims that Nabataean cities were unfortified. However, the project revealed such a small portion of Nabataean Isla that it is unwise to overinterpret this evidence. It is, in fact, difficult to believe that a city of such size lacked any monumental structures. The artifact assemblage is also quite instructive. The, the ceramic corpus is dominated by locally produced corsairs. 
More surprisingly, uh, uh, more surprising is the relatively high percentage of imported coarse wares, primarily from the Petra region, despite the fact that, I, that, that, that Petra lies about 100 kilometers north of Isla. Most, most oil lamps in Unguentaria uh, uh, are representing imports of bottled perfume derived from Petra. 84% of the dated Nabataean painted fine wear dates prior to the Roman annexation of 106, primarily to the late 1st century AD, suggesting continued vigorous contact with Petra up to the Roman annexation. Camel caravans carrying imports from Isla to Petra needed to return, whether directly to Isla and or via Gaza, and thus could transport Pe Petra's pottery, perfume, and other goods back to Isla. The main source of imported amphorae was Gaza, presumably carrying wine. Importation of ESA began with the foundation of Isla, accelerated through the first and continued into the early second century AD. The quantities of ESA recovered at Isla, more than 2,000 sherds, suggest that this was not merely for local consumption, but also for transshipment via the Red Sea. Another major import is glass vessels. There is no evidence for local glass production. The uh, glass from the Nabataean era includes a high percentage of luxury wares, probably from Egypt. There's little evidence of imported stone in this period, including a complete absence of imported marble, as has been noted in other client states of the Roman East. One may draw several observations from a partial analysis of the archaeobotanical evidence currently available. The assemblage from these samples is dominated by agricultural weed species, cereal grains, and cereal chaff, uh, raising the possibility that some local agricultural production beyond the expected crops, such as dates. The faunal evidence includes terrestrial and marine species. Enormous quantity of fish and mollusca also await full analysis, but both were clearly key elements of the local food supply. Evidence of terrestrial animals interestingly reveals little change over time, and thus is combined in this table in the interest of time. Not surprisingly, sheep and goat dominate the assemblage, followed in descending order by chicken, pig, camel, and cow. Apart from evidence of trade, what of economic production at Nabataean Isla? The documentary sources are silent on this topic, yet the archaeological record furnishes significant new evidence, albeit fragmentary. Ceramics com comprise the most compelling evidence for local production, including ceramic slag and kiln wasters from Nabataean contexts. Further, there is evidence for export of Isla's ceramic production to southern Jordan and the Negev. There is limited evidence for metalworking, including iron and copper slag. An intriguing possibility is local production of high-quality garum, or fish sauce, from this period, as suggested by the contents of a local ceramic jar from a Nabataean context. In short, Isla emerged with a vibrant and diverse economy after its foundation in the late 1st century BC. There is little reason to doubt assertions in literary sources that transshipment of aromatics from the southern Arabian Peninsula to Petra and Gaza on the Mediterranean was the heart of the city's commercial economy. This, this traffic required baggage animals, drivers, escorts for um, security. Both the caravan and the marine traffic uh, required a wide array of products and services. Nabataean officials were likely present to levy tariffs and the garrison was probably st uh, stationed at Isla for its protection as explicitly mentioned for the Nabataean port of Luque Come, farther down the Red Sea coast in this period. Isla already hosted several industries, including ceramics, some for export, a shellfish and fishing industry, and production of iron and copper artifacts. Uh, we now move to the economy of, of a late Roman island in the second and third centuries. The transition from Nabataean to Roman rule in 106 witnessed considerable discontinuity in occupation at Isla. All three northern domestic complexes were abandoned, and a major southern area suffered some kind of destruction and, and abandonment. However, Isla made a quick recovery from the tumult of the Roman invasion. The city flourished uh, throughout the remainder of the second and third centuries. In fact, once reoccupied, even the northern domestic areas, once abandoned, suggest little change in function compared to the Nabataean era. Significantly more... Uh, botanical evidence is available then for the preceding period. As discussed above, it may suggest some local agricultural production in this period. One new species, 
species first appears in small quantities at Isla in this period. Cotton, a likely imported from India where it was first cultivated. The artifactual evidence also offers insights. Continued importation of both utilitarian courseware and Nabataean fineware from Petra continued in some quantity well into the second century. Imports of Eastern Sigillata A also continued into the mid to late second century, replaced in the third century by large amounts of African red slip tableware from North Africa and some Egyptian red slip, ERS, as seen here. One notable change is the primary source of imported wine as reflected by the amphorae. Although imports from Gaza predominated in the second century, by the late third century, wine amphorae from Egypt began to supersede those from Gaza. It is tempting to associate this change with two factors. First is the, is the reopening of, of, of the Nile Red Sea Canal in the early second century, providing an all-water route between the Nile Valley and Isla. Second is the decline in the commercial significance of the Petra-Gaza Road, Petra-Gaza Road, uh, in the mid-third century. As suggested above, there is evidence for a triangular route connecting Isla, Petra, and Gaza from Isla's foundation that likely continued until the mid-third century. A uh, reduction in trade between Isla and both Petra and Gaza is suggested at Isla itself by the decline in Gaza amphorae by the 3rd century at Isla, as well as a precipitous decline in ceramic imports from Petra. Uh, as this table shows, as, uh, although a significant quantity of 2nd century Nabataean painted fineware sherds emerged from Isla, albeit sharply reduced from the 1st century, a catastrophic decline in the 3rd century is apparent. The glass, all imports to Isla, reveals interesting changes in the second and third centuries. The luxury tablewares and storage vessels that characterize the first century are replaced by more utilitarian tablewares. This period also witnessed new imports, for example, uh, exotic stones such as marble, alabaster, and steatite. Marble likely from the Aegean, appears to be spoilia from monumental structures somewhere in Isla in this period. Most alabaster is, um, it is vessel fragments, uh, likely from Egypt. Steatite from the Arabian Peninsula, imported for specialized cooking vessels, probably was a, quote, cargo of opportunity, unquote, along with shipments of um, aromatics. Finally, what of economic production at Isla in the 2nd and 3rd centuries? The predominance of local coarse wares and ceramic slag and kiln wasters suggests substantial ceramic production in this period. Some production continued as exports as far north as Petra. Metalworking in both copper and iron continued, suggested by finds of metal ore and slag. Working of both bone and shell also appears in this period, which may reflect household level production of these materials. Harvesting of fish and mollusks continued, judging from the enormous quantities from late Roman contexts across the site. Some of this marine harvest was undoubtedly exported, although the scale is difficult to quantify. Textile production at some level also seems a given, although again perhaps a limited to small-scale household activity, suggested by spindle whorls, pins, and needles. Otherwise, textile production was likely another invisible industry, quote-unquote, from an archaeological perspective. In short, despite the fact that the late Roman period at Isla began with a foreign military conquest, the city seems to have made a rather rapid recovery. Isla was the crucial nexus connecting the southern terminus of the newly constructed uh, Trajanic Highway from southern Syria, the traditional incense road through the Arabian Peninsula, and the sea routes from both South Arabia and Egypt. Turning now to Isla's economy in the 4th and 5th centuries, uh, we must begin with the arrival of Legio Decima Fratensis in the reign of Diocletian circa 300, one of four legions stationed along the Arabian frontier. Here's the four. Isla, the 10th legion, is, is at the far south of this image. Uh, 
Uh, given the small size of Isla compared to other regional centers, the arrival of at least a thousand soldiers plus their dependents greatly increased local demand for food and other resources. However, the, the legionaries also contributed a, a significant new influx of cash into the local economy. Also of prime importance was the revival of Red Sea trade, as suggested in literary sources and at other Red Sea ports. Finally, the rise of Christianity, accompanied by church construction, monasteries, and growth of regional pilgrimage, added another element to the local economy. Major changes are visible at Isla around the turn of the 4th century, including the widespread abandonment of areas that once constituted the northwestern sector of Nabataean and late Roman Isla. A monumental mud brick building, perhaps a church erected around the turn of the 4th century, was destroyed in the earthquake of 363 and not rebuilt. Um, the only uh, significant trace of human activity beyond the city wall was a cemetery just beyond the wall located in this area. In stark contrast to the picture north of the city wall, the sector south of the wall yielded evidence for the continued economic vitality of Isla. Ceramic production increased significantly. This was spurred not only by enhanced local demand from the 10th Legion and the revival of Red Sea trade, but now for vastly increased levels for export, as documented by the wide distribution of Isla ceramic vessels, such as this Isla amphora was found in the mountains of Yemen in the southern Arabian Peninsula. Uh, the evidence for imported fineware is also instructive. The local market is dominated by African red slip from North Africa, supplemented by some, by some Egyptian red slip, and by the late 4th century, a small quantity of so-called Cypriot red slip. Notable is the almost total absence of Phocaean red slip from the Aegean, which dominates the fineware assemblages in this era at many sites in northern Palestine and Jordan. A handful of sherds from Aksum in Ethiopia, South Arabia, and India hint at Isla's wider commercial connections in this period. Egyptian amphorae dominate the assemblage of imported transport jars of the 4th and 5th century, although Gaza remains a secondary source. The imported glass also reveals changes from the late Roman period. The quantity of glass increases significantly, both in terms of utilitarian vessels and more elaborate luxury types. A few pieces of ivory and other rare luxury import, likely from Africa, also appear in this period. Other imports, which, appear, for which first appeared in the 3rd century, arrive in large numbers in this period, including marble, alabaster, and steatite, seen here. Finally, what about local economic production in the 4th and 5th centuries? The quantity of local courseware pottery, kiln wasters, and ceramic slag certainly documents substantial ceramic production in this period. Much of this local production was exported not only to sites as far north as Petra, but also along the littoral of, of the Red Sea and beyond to East Africa, the Southern Arabian Peninsula, and even to India. These Isla vessels, primarily amphorae and pilgrim flasks, were, of course, merely containers, and their content is debatable. They may have carried food products produced at Isla itself, fish sauce, dates, or date wine, or represent agricultural goods brought to Isla from elsewhere for, for repackaging and reshipment and transshipment. The metalworking industry in both copper and iron continued, as suggested by finds of metal ore and slag. There is also increased evidence of working of bone, ivory, and shell. The harvest of mollusks and fishing continued. Some was exported as Red Sea fish, for example, are widely attested in southern Jordan and the Negev. Overall, the economy of early Byzantine Isla was booming in this era. Uh, fueled by a revival of regional and international trade, the continued growth of several local industries, plus a new factor, a substantial military garrison and its dependents. Pilgrimage traffic likely began in this period, although probably was not yet a significant factor in the local economy. Now for the late Byzantine period, the, uh, the, the relative paucity of evidence from Isla itself in this period limits our understanding but still permits some insights. Isla remained a key nexus of regional and international trade as suggested by documentary sources. These ceramics suggest a continued local production of coursewares for both for, for, uh, for both local consumption and for export. The value of the latter was clearly in the contents of these ceramic containers. Isla continued to import some pottery for special purposes, although with clear changes in sources, especially fine tablewares. African red slip 
formerly dominant, declines dramatically in the mid to late 5th century, reflecting a wider regional pattern. Import of Egyptian red slip continued, but in lesser quantities. Cypriot red slip increased in quantity in the 6th century, but never approached the earlier levels of ARS imports. In short, the imported fine wear reaching Isle in the late Byzantine period was sharply reduced in quantity compared to earlier periods. In contrast, the evidence of imported amphorae suggests minimal change from the early Byzantine period. Egyptian amphorae continued to predominate with Gaza as the secondary supplier. A, a few sherds of Aksumite ware suggest continued contact with East Africa, yet abundant trade is suggested by the abundance of um, Isle of Pottery scattered over the surface of, of Adulis, which was the port of Aksum, Aksum lying about here on our map. And the explicit mention of Isla merchants in Adulis by Cosmas Indicoplustes. These merchants likely returned to Isla with products not normally found in the archaeological record, such as spices. As always, we are left to speculate about the extent of Isla's traffic in aromatics, although always stressed in documentary sources. Other key imports include steatite vessels from the Arabian Peninsula, marble from the Aegean, and alabaster from Egypt. In terms of local economic production, the limited evidence provides only a few hints apart from the vibrant ceramics industry cited above. Certainly the harvesting of fish and mollusk continued, some likely for export. There is also some evidence for continued metalworking in both copper and iron. Despite limited evidence, Isla surely continued to flourish in this era, fueled by several forces, vibrant regional and international trade, a vigorous a ceramics industry, and growth in Christian pilgrim traffic to Sinai. A potential drag on the growth was the disappearance of, of the 10th Legion, whether transferred elsewhere or simply demobilized. Nevertheless, such negative forces do not seem to adversely affect the local urban economy to any significant extent. The core of Isla's economy had always been trade. Both the distribution of Isla Amphorae and surviving documentary sources suggest that Isla remained one of the key ports of the Red Sea, flourishing well into the Islamic period. In, in conclusion, as expected from literary sources, Isla was a major nexus of trade uh, you know, throughout its history, including far-flung connections with both Mediterranean and Red Sea literals. Most, most uh, um, most frustrating, however, is our inability to measure in any meaningful way the level of imported aromatics, clearly a major, if not the major, import to Isla in economic terms, and yet nearly invisible archaeologically. However, diachronic analysis uh, suggests further significant changes in sources and quantities of many traded goods. Further, Isla hosted several industries, a fact absent from documentary sources, such as ceramics, metalworking, and boneworking. Uh, although Isla likely produced some food and other resources locally, given its hyper-arid climate, its population was to a greater or, or lesser degree dependent on imported resources for local consumption.